There we go. Uh, so uh, Bernard has been studying marbled merlets for a few decades now, uh, as I said, for Canadian Wildlife Service and also the province. He's done nesting surveys, behavioral studies, at sea studies, habitat and environmental assessments, and nest searches. And uh, he's, he's promised to give us a little bit of the dirt on uh, what is going on in the world of marbled merlets. I know that that's a very favorite bird of some of the people in the room here tonight. And uh, I think it may end up being a favorite bird of a lot more after Bernard's talk. So Bernard, if you're ready to share your screen. Okay. Get going. And let's see what I need to uh, go to the slideshow, I guess here. Yes, that's right. Oops. Yeah. Uh, it's about the fifth one across. Yeah. It's probably underneath yep. your little. Menu. It is, yeah. Okay, menu. Let me just. Uh, you can also start it using the little um, slide screen down on the lower right next to where it says 76%. Okay. Just, just to the left of that. That one. There we go. Thanks. Okay. So here we go. Um, how do I minimize that uh, the uh, screen sharing screen? There should be a little bar on it, or you can just drag it right out of the way. Okay. Okay. So yeah, tonight we're going to talk about marbled merlets, um, sort of uh, seabirds of the rainforest here, a coastal uh, you know, endemic to the temperate rainforests of North America. And um, so we're going to go over a bit of the current status, um, the biology of uh, the merlet and, and its habitat, and a, a bit about threats and recovery. Um, I was trying to make this into a little, I don't do these talks very often. And so I'm going to try and pull it off. I don't, I, um, I was going to try and uh, personalize it a little bit more and, and make it more about personal experiences, but, uh, it's managed to be more geeky than, uh, than, uh, than I was originally uh, envisioning anyways. Um, so there's a little juvenile there, by the way, uh, on the screen, and that we saw last summer up uh, on the central coast. And uh, so in terms of uh, global status, um, global population is thought to be in the neighborhood of 400,000 uh, individuals and about uh, around 100,000 of those are in BC. They're listed uh, federally as threatened in, in Canada on the basis of nesting habitat loss. And uh, in the USA, they're listed as uh, threatened in Washington, Oregon, and California. And uh, oops, and oh man, and uh, oh, sorry. And uh, they're a conservation concern in Alaska. So the bulk of the global population is in Alaska, but. Uh, um, Alaska, um, just a few years ago, thought they had uh, in the order of six, seven hundred thousand birds, and then they did a, a big status review and came up with far fewer than they had uh, uh, originally thought they had. Um, and uh, so the current status, um, we got an overall population decline with uh, regional variation throughout the coast. Um, as far as we can tell, they've declined in the, around 17% since 1996 and around 4% since 2012. And the declines are driven by east and southwest Vancouver Island and the southern mainland coast areas, which 
coincidentally have had the greatest amount of of logging and habitat removal um and uh there's an indication of stable counts in western north vancouver island and and some increasing counts on the central and northern mainland coasts and uh, we'll have a look um as the slideshow goes on on some of those um uh regions that uh we call conservation regions in BC. So the marbled merlet is a uh, Brachyranthus marmoratus, so a short beaked mottled seabird of the auk family. It's about the size of a large robin, about 250 grams, and, uh, and the long lived about 10 years plus. And so here we've got uh, painting out an old field guide in winter plumage and summer plumage. Um, so marbled merlets, uh, they eat uh, small fish and invertebrates. They fly underwater to capture fish. And they're actually, you know, they when they're flying through the air, their wings are beating really fast. When they're flying through the water, they're, it looks almost the, the same, except their wings are beating slower. And uh, they need to um, they need to reach seventy kilometers hour, an hour to get lift off the water, and flight speeds over land usually on the way inland kind of range between seventy and one hundred kilometers an hour, and then when they're exiting the forest and the and the terrestrial land base, they're I've clocked them at one hundred and sixty plus kilometers an hour, and so they're probably descending maybe with a tailwind. Um, but it's it's incredibly fast. They eat uh, sand lance, herring, capelin, salmon smolt. Um, they really seem to love sand lance. And so you may find them in places where sand lance are abundant, you know, broken group islands and places like that where they're, they're uh, probably targeting that uh, species. And uh, merlis are, you know, they're adapted for life at sea. They're a true seabird in that they only come to land to nest. Their fe feathers are thick and dense to keep out the cold. They have a dense fat layer on a sort of a round shaped body. The feet are webbed like a duck's. They're small but, and used for propulsion only when the bird swims on the surface. Underwater, they use their feet to rudder and uh, steer and uh, use their wings to uh, uh, their wings as flippers and um, so um, uh, it really flies underwater and they, they can go fast enough to catch fish so um, they're an amazing little bird they dive up to 30 meters deep and of course other alcids can dive you know common mirror can dive 100 meters down but um in a similar sort of way that marbled merlets uh, fly underwater, um, all alcids do that sort of thing. And uh, so, in terms of range, we uh, we just mentioned that a little earlier. The breeding range is occurs wherever there's temperate rainforest in North America. So, from Northern California all the way through to Alaska, and um, and then in, in BC, we've uh, split the coast up into seven conservation regions. The, the seventh one on the Alaska border is, uh, is uh, inland of the coast. Um, and, uh, and this is what we use for study and management of marbled merlets. Um, uh, we use these different uh, coastal designations here, southern mainland coast, central mainland coast, northern mainland coast, Haida Gwaii, and West and North Vancouver Island, and then East Vancouver Island. <clears throat> um, in the 1800s, there were an estimated uh, uh, tenfold more marbled merlets. Uh, in the early 1900s, loggers called them fog larks, and um, and but you know they no one really knew uh, there were these anecdotes of, of these birds flying through the forest that uh, you know the, but the nesting habits were unknown and and the subject of a lot of speculation and um and uh so you know it wasn't until the first nest was discovered that prompted uh, an intense study of the bird um so they uh 
marbled murrelet's nest on large mossy limbs and old growth forests near the coast. You know, nests have been found up to 70 kilometers inland um, in Washington state, for instance. And um, it's likely that the bulk of the population nests, you know, within 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers of the coast. They uh, tend to fly long distances to find a secret little spot, very cryptic. And uh, unlike other seabirds, they, they don't nest colonially. They, they, they nest in incredibly low densities. So it's the it was the last species in North America whose nesting habits were unknown until the first active nest was found in a tree in California in 1974 by a tree climber who um, who uh, nearly uh, stepped on the this bird and he saw this little this little uh, um, nestling uh, and thought it was really strange and then when he picked it up he saw the webbed feet and then he really knew it was strange and so you know he uh, he had a bit of a personal policy not to um, disturb uh wildlife uh or as little as possible when he was doing his tree work this was in a in a national park that had just had a massive snowstorm a lot of downed trees and so he was in there on the on the cleanup effort and wind firming effort of the trees and this is where he discovered this this merlet and uh it was a huge mystery until then it's it's um uh, there are there are lots of speculation. There were some fraudulent claims and people that claimed they had a nut, uh, an egg and and uh, and that sort of thing. So the first nest in Canada was found in the Walbran in 1989, and the first active nest was found in 1993 on the Sunshine Coast in the Karen Range. <clears throat> so you can see from the drawing that the uh, the nest is uh, usually tucked in fairly close to the trunk of the tree with uh, with overhead screening foliage and and a flight path up into the tree. And this is where the characteristics of old growth are particularly conducive to um, having the right characteristics for merlets to work their way in and out of there. As we said, they, they need to reach 70 kilometers an hour to get lift off the water. Their wings are beating eight to 10 times a second they're um, flying in uh, and they tend to funnel through topography. So they're funneling in through uh, inlets and valley systems and um, and uh, and probably at altitude. And then they, you know, old growth has uh, incredible um, variation in, in uh, canopy height and canopy gaps and and uh, all this um, all this variable um, structure with clear stem up you know uh, you know the merlet uh, so the merlet can't slow down like a forest bird can so it has small wings large body mass and um, so it actually does an aerial, uh, it does a dive down into a canopy gap and an aerial stall into the limb that, uh, it, and all of this at, you know, 3.30, 4 in the morning in the dark. Yeah, nests are usually at least 20 to 40 meters above the ground. Um, and uh, so... A nest, uh, a merlet, uh, they, lay, they lay one egg. Um, the female has a second egg follicle where it can produce a second egg if, a, if, the, if it's early enough in the, in the season that it may, might lose an egg for some reason. And, um, and uh, they incubate for around 30 days. Then the chick is fed in the nest for another 28, 30 days until it fledges. And then the fledged chick has to make a flight to sea. If it doesn't make it to sea, it's it's probably not going to survive. Uh, so here we got an adult on the nest, and uh, and then here's a, a nestling. You can see how cryptic the plumage of the nestling is. Um, and you know, I've I've worked with oops, sorry, I've worked with climbers who 
who have have found an active nest and again you know it, at first they're like what is that it's, it looks like a big ball of, of of mold or 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 some kind of moldy growth or something and then it's oh man it's a merlot chick you know so in terms of research um you know we we want to try and figure out how many merlots do we have left and uh and where are they going and so um we do a lot of work on abundance measures uh population studies and uh, trend monitoring population trend monitoring using uh ornithological radar and what it is is just a marine radar that that's been modified the antenna has been modified to um to look above horizon rather than uh, a typical marine radar is is centered on horizon and uh, and uh, these antennas have been modified so that the full vertical beam width is used is is utilized above horizon just for the purpose of seeing birds and so at a low a low enough range uh, with the gain turned up it'll pick up small flying objects even moths and and uh Large insects can be picked up by the radar, um, bats, um, other flying, you know, other birds. Um, and uh, we access um, locations, uh, you know, by boat, by helicopter, by four-wheel drive vehicle, and uh, and um, and need to set up in such a way that we're ready to survey by around three three in the morning so usually we're set up the night before <clears throat> whatever vehicle we're in or or however we're uh we've um accessed the location and um so a couple of uh radar stations um so you know these these are located up at the heads of inlets just off the estuary of of uh of uh river mouths and you know, in BC, we have this uh, classic um, glacial, uh, glaciated topography, U-shaped values and valleys, and the, the merlots uh, funnel through that, basically the valley profile. We used to think they just follow the river up, but uh, common mergansers do that, but merlots, they, they, they're flying at higher altitude, far above the, the, high, the top of the forest, and uh, and in general and um and following the general valley profile and um so this uh this is a place up on the central coast called Quatna river um where uh we've been seeing some incredibly high counts of marbled merlets um so again of the of the station we just looked at um uh here we got um the radar screen on the left showing uh, a few different bird targets flying around. Um, and uh, um, so these, uh, if you can see my uh, the pointer on my mouse, uh, these would be marbled merlets. And this looks like it's a pair of merlets flying together. Uh, a pair would show up as a single target, unless they're flying at least 25, 30 meters apart, then, you know, and, and these birds tend to fly kind of meandering in a meandering pattern a little bit, fairly direct, but slightly meandering. So they're sometimes flying apart and coming together and you can kind of see that on the radar screen also. And then uh, the other targets there, the other, these are probably gulls flying here. And uh, and then there's a, a chart view of, of that location showing the extent of the radar coverage, which is about a 1500 meter radius. Uh, and so in this particular location, you know, the merlots are coming in mostly through over above water here. And uh, and so we're able to, you know, see the the sum total of the flight path. Another couple radar station uh, examples, of places I've been in the last couple of years. Um, here's at Pachydat Beach, um, close to Port Renfrew, uh, at the mouth of the Gordon River. Uh, and uh, here you can see birds flying in and out of the uh, Gordon, as well as uh, San Juan Valley. And, um, and uh, so there's a 
the radar screen here, you can actually see the uh, the 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 wave break line here along the beach. Here's the mouth of the Gordon River. Um, these are different birds flying around in the bay. Here's uh, marbled merlets flying up into the Gordon system. Uh, here's a couple birds. Looks like merlets over here flying um, roughly towards Ferry Creek and points beyond that. Uh, Ferry Creek is, you know, one of those places that's been in the news, and and it's a that's an important spot for merlets. Any kind of, especially on the southwest island, any place that has a large area of uh, intact habitat will be a a stronghold for merlets. I'm I'm pretty certain. And then uh, here's a map view of that same location. So there's the you know what we were looking at at the mouth of the Gordon River, and then in in green is is modeled marble merlet habitat. Uh, it's all old growth forest in in that area. You know we'd be missing any birds that might be uh, nesting further out in in uh, San Juan Harbor, but um, we're hoping to catch any kind of birds flying up into the Gordon system. We also um, use audio visual surveys to detect marbled merlets. Um, this is more focused on on local behavior in a in a in a for in a nesting stand or a, a a patch of forest where that might be may or may not be used by merlets for nesting, and um, you know. These surveys can tell us, you know, presence and, and probable absence, but they can also tell us some information that <clears throat> the radar can't really uh, discern the same way, and that's occupied behaviors. So any any kind of below canopy behaviors in the Merlet survey world <clears throat> are considered occupied behaviors and in indicators that that they could be nesting in nearby in that patch of forest. And um and uh, <clears throat> this, um, you know, the occupied detections status uh, holds a lot of management weight, especially in the United States. Um, and uh, um, you know, finding an actual nest is much, much more labor intensive, and it's not like finding a passer and nest, which is hard enough to start with. Um, because these nests are 20 to 40 to 50, 60 meters up in trees. We also do audiovisual detection surveys as a support for, for the radar surveys um, to confirm any kind of merlets that can be detected and uh, also to detect other fast flyers just to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, radar survey is not um, miscounting, uh, you know, a red-throated loon or or uh, band-tailed pigeons, um, common mergansers, all will show up in a similar way as marbled merlets on the radar screen. And it's quite, it's interesting that the merlets show up so prominently on the radar screen. They show up as if they were larger than a gull or a crow. Um, and they show up as if they were a common merganser because of that dense fat layer and uh, and the round body shape. They tend to have a very strong resolution on on the radar. You can see the radar up on the roof of my a roof rack of my truck in the uh, photo on the right. Uh, another <clears throat> yeah increasingly used. Uh, uh, piece of technology uh, is to do bioacoustic work is the uh, autonomous recording unit here shown um, uh, attached to a uh, old growth Sitka spruce tree. And uh, these can um, uh, record presence and vocal activity patterns and behaviors. And, and there's some bioacoustic people working on uh, uh, recognizing individuals uh, using this, which is an interesting uh, prospect. 
another uh, another tool that we use to look at Merlet's uh, uh, our low level aerial habitat surveys. Um, using helicopters, we uh, we um, first of all using modeling and and mapping. Uh, uh, VRI mapping our vegetation resource inventory that the province has. We uh, we look at you know we pull out the areas of potential suitable habitat and then fly those areas and rank the polygons of habitat um, in, in order to come up with uh, uh, an idea of where merlets are most likely nesting. And uh, so here we're uh, working on a, uh, aerial surveys last year in Strathcona Park. And uh, the idea here is to fly low and slow over the forest. You know, we're, uh, we've got uh, some, um, you know, arc pad running and, uh, and following along in real time so that we can enter, uh, enter ranks uh, in the correct locations on the mapping. Um, so this is the pro this is the results of uh, of some of our work. The dotted lines show the the flight path that the helicopter took, and uh, the uh, darker colors are the are the better habitat. You know, not surprisingly, in, lower down in the valley bottoms and um, and along the lower slopes in general. Uh, um, you know, upper slopes and, and higher elevation habitats are generally low and very low quality for merlets. There's just few less moss overall, fewer large branches and uh, shorter trees. And um, uh, yeah, so, so this is the kind of thing um, then in for for the province's purposes they 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 would manage for the top three classes moderate high and very high and uh, statistically we can't really tell a difference between those three classes in terms of merlet preferences but uh and then there are merlets that will use low quality habitat to to nest in it uh, as far as we know it's around 10 percent of the population that may choose a lower quality uh, nest, nesting habitat, you know, in our estimation, what, what we would call lower quality. Um, you know, we do ground tra habitat transects and potential nest platform counts from the ground too. This is, you know, again, it's labor intensive and, and you can't cover the kind of area you can cover by helicopter, but uh, here you can get a much closer look at um, at um, at the nesting structure you can look at the platform limbs and and moss amounts and and that sort of thing with your binoculars and um, and uh, and we there's a whole set of uh, provincial protocols for measuring nesting habitat and that sort of thing also um, to actually find nests, you need to climb trees using uh, soft climbing techniques, and that's um, uh, compound bows with um, uh, eighty pound test line and uh, an arrow with a, a weighted blunt tip, and then it, again you use your binoculars to find good limbs to uh, shoot up into uh, something that looks like it can support, you know, a climber's weight and uh with with some structure below maybe as a as a safety um and uh yeah you shoot shoot these uh, arrows up pull over accessory cord pull over climbing rope and anchor that off and then the climber ascends on ascenders uh, up the rope up to uh, the limb and then <clears throat> and then as you can see the climber on the right has a, a whole accessory rope uh, with him. So once he gets up to that limb, then he can continue uh, off of his uh, access line with this accessory rope and work his way up into the canopy and uh, investigate the platform limbs for evidence of nesting. Um, <clears throat> some climbers are quite adept and can uh, repel on a taut line hitch into neighboring trees. And uh, I've worked with climbers who are able to 
um, to uh, work their way through five or six uh, old growth trees before ever coming back down to the ground. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> here's a photo of a, a merlet chick on a nest. And this is about a 35 day old chick. It's, it's, it's overdue for fledging. Um, and it's still in its, uh, in its downy feathers. Uh, the nest, this nest is 60 meters above the ground in an old growth Douglas fir tree with abundant mossy platform limbs, as you can see. It's got good overhead head crown closure for security. It's got good flight access in and out of the nest. And it's a small but a good quality nesting patch embedded within a larger low quality polygon located 75 kilometers inland in Washington state. Another thing we do is uh, seabird surveys uh, and at sea surveys to detect densities and aggregations of merlets and other seabirds uh, throughout the coast. Um, uh, this is off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, the one shot is in Nootka Sound on the left, and um, and uh, this um, merlets are considered a nearshore species. Um, they're considered to live within five kilometers of the shore, but there are certain times of the year when when they seem to disappear and uh, and uh, and they're not easy to find. Other times of year when yeah, they're in 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 the places we expect to find them. Uh, closer to the coast. And, you know, here's a, a map just showing uh, uh, at sea aggregations that have been discovered. And, and it uh, also shows some of the coastal radar sites that, uh, that we try and visit uh, uh, funding dependent and uh, in uh, areas of Vancouver Island. Um, you know, we've got uh, a couple hundred radar locations throughout the coast that have been surveyed in the past, and uh, and and from that, there's um, a subset of of long term monitoring locations that uh, uh, around ten to each conservation region, and uh, and those are locations that we try and visit um, and repeat visits to. Uh, following a, a survey design, a monitoring design that uh, that uh, was derived through a long a roundtable uh, um, set of meetings at UBC back in around two thousand five to um, to monitor a trend and population. So. Um, uh, the province has come up with a, a habitat model using land cover information, uh, a habitat algorithm, and basically any old growth forest. So um, forest stands over 141 years old and over 28 and a half meters tall. That would be, a, they call it a height class four, would be over 28 and a half minute, uh, meters tall and age class eight, uh, 141 years old. So that would be sort of considered disturbed old growth and, and old growth as age class nine, which would be 250 years and up. Um, we also, uh, in general, merlets tend to nest uh, below 900 meters. Uh, it's assumed uh, in the southern part of the province and uh, below 600 meters on the central and northern coasts. And there's a couple other uh, models that are in use for Haida Gwaii and, and Clackwood Sound. Um, so um, the model output, um, um, it's, uh, suit, you know, the, it predicts high quality habitat throughout the province and throughout the coast. Um, and uh, so as far as we can tell, there's around, uh, as of 2002, there's, there's around two, th 2 million hectares of suitable nesting habitat in the province. Threats, uh, number one 
threat is uh, considered to be uh, nesting habitat loss, uh, logging of old growth forest throughout the coastal region of BC. Uh, number two threats, uh, um, predators such as northern goshawk, uh, Stellar's jay, um, Douglas squirrel, uh, crows and ravens, and, uh, and gulls. Uh, other predators include flying squirrels, mice, and gray jays. Um, nest predation is the greatest cause of breeding failure for marbled merlets. Uh, adults are vulnerable as well as the, the eggs. Um, corvids, uh, jays, ravens, and crows are the most common nest predators. And squirrels are also suspected of taking chicks, and uh, ravens, hawks, owls, eagles are known to kill adult merlets. The risk of predation from corvids is, is, is likely higher at the edges of forests where human activities attract these omnivorous birds. Uh, and in fact, in places such as California, they, where pretty much all of the nesting habitat left is in national parks that are visited by people. They have some, some really extensive education programs and uh, protocols in parks to avoid any kind of attractants to uh, to corvids. And in fact, a merlets, um, merlets that have been monitored uh, um, for disturbance have been more, more disturbed by the sound of corvids than, corvids than by the sound of helicopters or chainsaws or or that sort of thing. That's the corvids are really the the um, uh, a real culprit. And um, again, this is where you know larger areas of old growth forest come into play. That you know, the corvids tend to frequent more the edges and and coastal fringes, and uh, and uh, and less often found in the interior forest. Uh, in a study that Josh Malt did a number of years ago using video cameras and artificial nests, he found 40% predation at nests of eggs and nestlings. 50% uh, of them were avian predators. 50% were mammals, such as squirrels and mice. Squirrels took eggs, mice preyed on fake nestlings. And he found that um, uh, nests near hard edges such as next to recent clear cuts were significantly more likely, likely to be predated than second growth or any soft edges such as river edges or avalanche edges. Um, other threats uh, include uh, commercial fisheries like gill nets, you know, um, any salmon opening, you know, you've got 120 boats gill netting right off the river mouth. And that's right where the, you know, potentially uh, mer uh, merlets and other alcids such as rhinoceros auklets are, are feeding and uh, in inadvertently they are caught up in nets. Uh, <clears throat> threats include oil spills, chronic oiling from ship traffic. Um, climate change, especially extended drought from, from some of the climate change effects we're seeing here on the coast, and, and even renewable energy, such as wind turbines and underwater wave and tidal turbines. Yeah, and climate change effects, uh, the extended drought are, you know, um, the extended droughts we've been seeing over the last few years um, are affecting trees, even in the wettest regions of the coast. Um, I noticed out in Clackwood Sound last summer, western red cedars uh, with brown tops right in right on the outer hypermaritime habitats. And, uh, you know, we don't really know how this will affect some of the nesting at attributes such as such as epiphyte growth or the profusion of, of epiphyte moss growth on trees. And um, so 
what are we doing to help the bird? Um, <clears throat> well, the pro, uh, first of all, in 2003, the Canadian Marbled Merlet Recovery Team, which I'm a member of, um, released recovery recommendations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it set a short-term overall population objective that requires retention of, of marbled merlet nesting habitat at 70% or greater from 2002 levels coastwide with a long-term objective to stabilize marbled merlet nesting habitat at 70% or greater than 2002 levels. Um, in 2014, Environment Canada released the federal recovery strategy. Uh, in 2018, uh, the province uh, released a cabinet approved implementation plan for the recovery of the marbled merlot. And in 2021, uh, the federal strategy was amended to include marine components. Um, federal recovery strategy identifies potential terrestrial critical habitat described by biophysical attributes related to nesting habitat and uh, and so it's it's set minimum amounts to recommended minute minimum amounts to retain within six conservation regions and uh, So it's a constant mapping exercise that's going on uh, by the province and the amounts of critical habitat throughout the province. And uh, habitat protection uh, includes parks, ecological reserves, conservancies, uh, biodiversity mining tourism areas and uh, new designations such as old growth management areas and wildlife habitat areas. Um, there are protected areas in coastal BC, uh, including places like Kutsimatin Provincial Park, Strathcona Provincial Park, and um, Atashish Khoi River uh, Provincial Park, um, to name a few. And uh, I think it, uh, it's about 26% of the coast is uh, in protected areas. Um, so we need about 63% of a goal outside of parks in crown lands. So we're, you know, the province is, is trying to designate around 900,000 hectares of habitat for marbled marlins. Some of the uh, designations, including wildlife habitat areas and old growth management areas. Um, and this is uh, an example of a small watershed up Effingham Inlet uh, called Brand Creek that I worked on back in the late 1990s. And, um, and it's now been an established wildlife habitat area since 2005. It's about 165 hectares. You can see a faint red outline there. It's the actual uh, habitat. This is another uh, uh, place that uh, uh, I nominated um, through the uh, request of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. They they wanted uh, to work with me on, on nominating uh, some wildlife habitat areas through that region um, that they could put forward to the province. And some of these areas, I think, are still under consideration. And uh, this particular uh, spot in Brem River, it shows the higher quality habitats. It shows the outlined area. It shows some uh, nests that had been found on some telemetry studies. And... Uh, and um, you can query a conservation data center uh, for found marbled merlet nests and uh, and come up with some of the locations they've been found. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting, uh, you know, just how widespread across the landscape they occur. <clears throat> and in summary, 
Um, so total Marvel Merlet nesting habitat in BC is about 2 million hectares. 26% uh, of this nesting habitat is in protected areas. This is about 37% of the habitat required to meet the recovery target. So we're looking at another 900,000 hectares is needed. And so uh, any of you uh, uh, on, on the meeting, um, uh, any way you know how to advocate for the conservation of old growth forests is, uh, is gonna be helpful to the marbled marlet. And uh, thanks to many people for contributing materials, photos, et cetera. Um, and uh, I also wanna thank, um, I've been doing this for, th for 30 years on the coast here in BC. And I wanna thank all the, all the people um, uh, that I've worked with over the years. It's uh, been, a real uh, treat to be involved in wildlife biology here in BC. Um, men, women, uh, young and old um, have, you know, worked together and provided a real collaborative atmosphere of, of curiosity and, and, uh, and, there's been so many good times uh, out in these far-flung places in the coast. It's uh, it's not easy. It turns into a bit of a marathon. You're you're doing crazy hours. You kind of get a little bit silly, and uh, and so it requires people that have a good attitude and like being out and like roughing it and. Um, and it's just been such a such an amazing experience in my work life here in BC. And that's about it. Well, thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting. I learned a ton of stuff I didn't know about Merlitz. Um, and there's some questions in the chat. We'll also allow people to unmute themselves to ask questions in person. And I see Tom's already already there. He's Unmuted and ready to ask you a question, aren't you, Tom? Indeed, I am. Uh, very, very interesting overview. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I could occupy the next hour here, <laughs> uh, with questions here, and uh, but I have uh, uh, one uh, main question on sort of the biology, and the other one con on conservation, just to sort of query you on a few things. Uh, the evidence that you mentioned is that they only come to uh, the land uh, during nesting. What is the evidence for that? Um, it's not, they're not like a duck, you know, they're not going to haul out on a rock and stand there. Um, I understand that. But what about yeah. winter? Winter. In the winter, they, in the winter, they're at sea the whole time. Sorry, that's not correct. We, I lived, mean, on, it, we lived on Haida Gwaii for, Many many years, and we we did marble murrelet surveys on over five hundred lakes. Uh, they come into the forest in winter, December first and January first. They're flying yeah. in at nighttime, so so they're they're utilizing the forest uh, in winter as well. So I just want to emphasize that, and that was reported in a uh, CWS uh, article some years ago. So that was one one issue is that unless you measure, unless you attempt to look at their flight behavior in winter. Obviously, you're not going to uh, determine one way or another whether they're actually uh, where they are in winter. So, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm aware that they do uh, they do fly in in and out of the forest in the winter time. Also, um, there are periods of of that like immediately post nesting, um, their numbers really decline. And uh, there was a bird, uh, you know, there's been very few satellite studies done to actually figure out where they do go. But there was one bird um, studied out of Hartley Bay that was caught in Hartley Bay and nested somewhere up near Kitimat uh, and probably in the Giltoys Valley. And and uh, by late July, it was back down around um, Gill Island, Hartley Bay. And then by early August, it was up in Prince William Sound, and by mid-August, it was out uh, west of Kodiak Island, and so it it, it traveled fourteen hundred kilometers, and and then and then they're probably undergoing a molt up there, 
And so during that time, they're probably just on the ocean. But then, as you said, yeah, later on in the winter, they're returning probably to their natal kind of areas or regions. And uh, and uh, who knows what they're doing in the winter? They're not nesting, but they're they're probably taking recruits, you know, flying in and out of the forest to get the get the routes figured out. To, you know, because again, they're doing this. You know, they're doing this at you know in in darkness or near darkness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, when you mentioned that um, they're flying at 700, 70 to one hundred kilometers per hour, and when they come in uh, and land on uh, the bed of bolus, etc., they're sort of they're dropping down. Uh, uh, has this been observed? Where they I've, drop, drop down? I've, at I've, I've observed it. Yeah, where I've I've watched a merlet. Let's say it was at about a you know two and a. 200 plus meters in the air and it just uh it just suddenly did a, a bank and just like straight down and uh and then i've watched them you know swoop up into the uh into the canopy also yeah uh, yeah. yeah that's that's what i was going to mention is they they have such heavy wing loading right that what we've we've actually watched them uh multiple times on the west side of Haida Gwaii uh on lakes where we sort of did our lot of work where they they come in on a flight corridor, basically, and there's only limited areas in the forest where they can basically approach. And then they go up like that and they lose velocity and then they, they settle back down. And they do that because when they take off, they plummet at great distances because they have to get quite a high speed. So yeah. it's very limited, the type of trees. They need that corridor in front of them. And so my, my yeah. point being here is that those 2 million hectares of old growth, yeah, it might be the total area, but within that, there's only a limited number of trees that are appropriate, actually, for these birds as nesting platforms. And so that would be, I guess, obviously the critical bit of information in terms of evaluating how much actual habitat has been actually preserved uh, for, for these birds. So, Yeah, nesting density, uh, that's been, you know, determined so far calculated so far uh, indicates around a pair maybe every 10 hectares of forest uh -huh. you know like so, yeah. right. so that actually speaks to one very of the low questions. very low density yeah. yeah yeah one of the questions that was in the chat bernard um is there can you have multiple nests in a single tree uh you know i don't know that there's ever been anyone that's been able to determine whether multiple nests have been in a single tree during the same season but i know climbers like in the bunster hills uh <clears throat> we did a you know there was a couple of huge climbing projects that went on there in uh, 1997 <clears throat> 98 and uh <clears throat> they found quite a few marbled merlet nests it's the largest nest sample found in bc was just in that area or above powell river and um and uh, um, there was one tree found with, I think, three nests in it, but they didn't all look uh, as if they had been used in the same season. There was there was no r real way to determine that. I right. don't think. So an another question along the same vein is, is there any evidence for nest reuse? Um, the assumption with that tree was that the tree was being reused possibly but, by the same board yes the same there's nest. some there's some evidence that uh that they reuse um the same tree or patch okay yeah um uh, we, i know tom you've got more questions so i'm going to come back to you but i'm going to okay, have thank, a, you. thank you other questions um yeah. asked first yeah. so everyone gets a chance uh walter and susan you've got your mm -hmm. hand raised Oh, hello. Um, I'm Walter, and I spent 46 years in Kitimat, actually, Bernard. Bernard and um, I always did the coastal water bird uh, um, surveys, but we found that the murrelets were steady. Uh, we could get up to, oh, 30, 40 murrelets, even from the shoreline on our coastal water bird surveys, right pretty much from well, it sometimes it didn't like. I mean, at nesting time, it was similar than it was to January and February. We could get oh, wow. up to 30, 
35, 40, even 50 muralists from the shoreline seeing them in the winter um, survey times. Now, um, I want to ask you about uh, some potential problems. And I hit them at, of course, is the is a big uh, um, uh, LNG facilities. And they're going to be bringing those big gigantic tankers in there tethered um, by tugs. And whenever I would go down Douglas Channel, we'd see hundreds and hundreds of muralettes along the shorelines of all the different fjords, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the habitat up there was fantastic for it. But that foraging habitat along the fjord um, coastline, uh, they would get outgoing, migrating uh, salmon fry and that kind of stuff. They're feeding there all the time in the summer. Uh, I guess they're getting all kinds of different creatures. But that disturbance by all of those tankers and the and the tethered uh, tugs with them, would that have a significant impact on um, uh, uh, on the muralettes? I'm thinking it might. I might. I, I don't know if I could say that definitively off the top of my head. Um, you know, my big concern would be if they're not careful about uh, any kind of oily wastes um, would really affect those birds. Um, you know, a lot of these birds typically are, they're, you know, they kind of stay out of the way of some of that stuff. Uh, and they're pretty averse to, to boats in general. Um, and they do, like you say, they do stick close to the, the edges of those inlets and, um, and they might, tuck into um, places with uh, more shallow areas and maybe a little more tidal mixing, you know, like at the mouth of the Giltoyes, they're just south of the Kitimat Arm and, yes. and in, in and out of, in and out of, um, uh, 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 what is it, um, the canal there um, that goes the up Gardner towards, canal. the Gardner the, Canal, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so, yeah, no, huh? It, it yeah I see I hear what you're it's saying a so it's a it, concern for sure and and it warrants some serious investigation and right I, they, I, it's, I it's, it doesn't seem to be on their radar of course uh, everybody thinks of the humpback whale uh, uh, and and the um, thin whales being vulnerable with that kind of thing and but uh, even muralettes to my mind would be somewhat vulnerable now just the last part of what i wanted to ask uh, there were the, all these um companies and there've been a lot of them investigating work at uh, places like Kitimat they do study after study of muralettes many many of them and radar surveys and so on why Ooh. can't that study material be part of the public domain uh, isn't isn't that justified they they did so many studies and yet we in the public uh don't in, in the amateur um um but you know birders and that kind of stuff we will sometimes ask but uh they say no no it's our data and that's the way it is but in a sense i think it should be public data any comment I think that's a huge issue uh, is <clears throat> uh, is the lack of transparency from from large uh, companies that uh, do these because in some cases there's some really great science being done and and exploring some really interesting questions and in some cases in places where no study has even been done before and so um, so there's a lot of gray literature that ends up on shelves somewhere in an office and you're right. So that's, you know, and I have done work, um, uh, I have done work, uh, on the resource side and, uh, and I have tried to be an intermediary, uh, and, and advocate for the sharing of, of the results of that work with, uh, let's say Canadian wildlife service, who is happy to receive any of that kind of information. And in some cases they have received some of that stuff. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have done a lot of work for Canadian wildlife service and for, and for the province. And, uh, and that information all does end up in the public domain. Um, and uh, you can query, there's a, there's a 2015 uh, 
uh, trend analysis in the journal PLOS One, and then there's a 2021 update in uh, Journal of Marine Ornithology on, on marbled merlot population trends. And I know in that 2015 PLOS One uh, journal uh, article, that's uh, it's under uh, Doug Bertram, B-E-R-T-R-A-M. -E um, in there, if you go into Appendix 3, you can find all the radar data uh, that's been gathered all over the coast, and you can see the numbers that have been counted in various uh, watersheds uh, all over the coast there. So, so there is quite a bit that is in the public domain uh, when you go and query through the federal or provincial governments. But but yeah, I agree with you. It, it's a huge issue that um, more of this uh, work that uh, private consultant com consulting consultants in large companies do on behalf of these corporate uh, interests um uh, i think uh, i think you know maybe it's up to the government to uh to mandate uh the sharing of that information right yeah. thank uh, you very much it was an excellent presentation i've thoroughly enjoyed it thanks, thanks. again thank thanks. you i'm going to ask two more questions from the chat and then we'll let tom have another stab at, at it okay so uh, one question is do the adults face any predation while at sea Ooh, I'm sure they do. Again, uh, nothing that I've seen. Um, oh, man, that's, you know, I, I can't just answer that off the top of my head. I'd have to. Okay. That's I'd have a fair to answer. Yeah. So we, we expect, we we're going to ask you questions about everything. And we accept that you may not be able to answer all of them. So here's another one in that same vein. Uh, when we see marbled merlots around Victoria in the spring and summer, is it possible that they're nesting locally? Are, are any nests known sort of in the urban areas of a Southern Vancouver Island? Yeah, um, they're nesting in the Sook watershed and uh, good on Victoria for having bought that watershed. And now they can control what kind of uh, logging goes on there. I don't know how much, and I'm sure there is, there's still some logging kind of lands on there, but I think they've pretty much stopped most of that and and um some of the habitat there doesn't look great when you compare it to let's say carmana valley or something like that but there are merlets nesting in there and uh you go there in the right time of year and you can be uh, uh you could uh encounter a ton of marble merlet activity and that's you know that's just one place i know that they're nesting up in the coxsila, coxsila valley and you know any place where there's you know there's a little provincial park there with some old growth douglas fir and there and up on that hillside close to the power lines there's old growth and we saw some incredible nesting behaviors there just a few years ago and uh yeah, there and there's um, little remnant uh, patches of old growth Douglas fir on some of the Gulf Islands, including the San Juans in the U.S. And uh, so there's some level of nesting that goes on there too. So yeah, some of those birds are nesting locally. I, I would say yeah. That's very cool. Okay, Tom, your turn hey. again. Um, yeah, just more uh, general comments. I, I I teach ecology at UVic and. Uh, I've gone onto the website uh, with regard to old growth protection and I'm just directly using their comments on their website is that they claim 3% of the low elevation old growth is going to be formally protected. And and I just wanted to get your perspective. I don't know how close you are or within the fold, so to speak, you know, but if if that is really the end point, thinking of a, Hundred years or two hundred years in the future, um, and the density of the murrelets is as close to the shore as basically uh, that your data is suggesting. Uh, what are the long-term consequences of of that three percent uh, protection uh, province province-wide? Mm, yeah, man, I we're already you know we're already starting with a baseline that maybe ten percent of what existed before logging yes. started on this coast, right? And uh, and we're trying to conserve seventy percent of that, and um, you know we're dealing with a population that's down to ten percent of what it might have been in the sometime in the early eighteen hundreds, and uh, you know it, it's it's not enough. 
<laughs> but uh, um, you know, there's a lot of competing interests, and uh, and uh, and it's it's a it's a tough one to uh, to stomach. Um, yeah, I you know I hope the Merlet can uh, can make it through this, but uh, yeah, you're right. I, I don't think it's enough. Yeah, yeah. Just my I'm I'm sort of pretty disturbed over this because my own student was arrested at Ferry Creek, you know, for trying to defend that old growth yeah. and, and and she was arrested uh, for reasons of destroying police property <laughs> rather than uh, the destruction, what was happening all around them. So mm, uh, to yeah. me, if I if I look into the future and that three percent is is realistic, um, it just it seems like a real dark future for all, all sorts yeah. of the, the lower elevation uh, species. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. And um, yeah. And then Ferry Creek, I mean, what a little, you know, a, a gem as a little intact tributary, intact tributary watershed on the south, southern part of the island. It's, it's not a common thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Bernard, so. uh, there's a couple of questions regarding the research itself. Um, and potential risks to the birds do you use drones for doing any of these studies uh we've uh played around with drones a bit uh i've done that uh with uh, someone down in victoria todd manning um and um you know for the habitat uh, the drone would be good for coming up with some like for developing you know high high res images of of little habitat areas and um unless you have a big long range like a large long range drone uh I, at this point it's not they're not being used um for the habitat assessment stuff but there are still the helicopter and uh observers uh running the mapping programs are still really the only way to cover huge huge areas the drones are the drones that uh, are kind of in the purview of consultants um just can't cover the huge areas that right. uh, the helicopter can so yeah. at, at this point not not so much so from from large scale to very tiny scale when you're shooting an arrow up over a branch to climb up how do you know that you're not going to disturb a nest in the process Good question. You you can't tell from the ground. Yeah. Uh, so generally climbing projects have been done, you know, targeting post nesting um, in August or, or even September when we're pretty sure that most birds have left a nest. But uh, funny enough, there was a nest discovered um, on a climbing project up in the Bunster Hills. And that nest was discovered, I think it was August 19th, and it was a bit of a surprise. So a late nesting bird. And uh, and we were able to observe that bird from a nearby uh, little hill. And, uh, you know, the climber discovered it by accident. He got out of the tree as fast as he could, luckily without disturbing it. And then we were able to watch the adults come in and feed the chick a couple times, which was really cool. I watched uh, an adult fly in and sit on the nest, sit on, sit near the chick. They looked at each other. The chick did a funny little slow circle around, like did a full 360, like in really small increments. It just would move a little bit. And it just did it all the way. And then the adult sat there looking at it with a big fish in its beak for like 15 minutes. And then a second adult flew in. And then now there were two adults with fish in their beaks. Uh, and then that adult fed the chick very quickly and then took off. And then the, finally, the first adult fed the chick, the fish it had, gave a single cure and took off. And, um, and within another, I think that, next morning the or the next evening the chick uh tore off all its downy feathers and then and then the morning after it uh, or no the next evening a full 24 hours later it it uh, fledged um jacques has a question for you uh, yes uh hello can you hear hello. me yes yes, yes. 
Uh, I'm curious about the size. What is the largest flock you've seen in the winter time together? Uh, what kind of numbers? I'm surprised at the numbers I see here around Victoria. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a flock of five to 600 of them together at one point. Oh, that's pretty cool. This is a large flock, isn't it? That's very large, yeah. Uh, yeah, what, what, I I don't think I've seen a flock larger than about 380, 400, and that was in the Gardner Canal kind of late in July. Um, around Victoria, I've never seen flocks that large. It's been more, you know, pairs and, you know, singles and pairs kind of scattered around a little bit more. This, um, uh, it, it, uh, it went on for an entire week in the Ogbe Islands. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. It's quite amazing. And by the way, long story short, I'm quite sure that they breed on the Chatham Islands, right, uh, right off Cadborough Bay here. Oh yeah, like could be, could, could be. be, could be. Uh, and Bernard, you've been at this for thirty years. So how many more years are you going to do marble merlet <laughs> research? Oh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, maybe as long as I can. All right. <laughs> so, uh, do any do any other merlets nest in BC, and are they competitors? Um, uh, Kitlitz's nest in Alaska. I don't. I think there's any record of Kitlitz's Merlitz nesting in BC. And they're not competing for the same uh, nesting habitat where because the Kitlitz's nest in burrows in the scree slopes in the mountains. And what about ancient Merlitz? Oh, an ancient um, would nest uh, in very, very few limited uh, colonial rocks. On, on the west coast of Haida, Haida Gwaii. So they're not really competing. They might, oh, you know, if you go up to Port Chanel during the nesting season, you'd get uh, ancients and marbles together in the same bay, but um, but uh, they're not competing for, for habitat. They might be competing for food, but yeah. Okay, and uh, one person is asking about the legality um, of logging old growth forests that contain marbled merlet nests, is that it does that not contravene the Migratory Bird Convention Act? Um, probably, and it seems like forestry gets a pass on all this stuff, doesn't it? Though, you know, you'd think that they need to do some pre-clearance surveys and that sort of thing but it, it doesn't happen and in the states you know they take all this a lot more seriously with the marbled merlet occupied behaviors and stuff like that that has direct management implications down there but then you have all these counter like lawsuits for take and all this sort of stuff too going on so it's a bit of a game and uh the industry seems to be well funded and uh and ready to play chess Right. So I partially answered a question that was in here saying that the parents bring fish into the nestlings. Is the type of moss important? Are they do they have preferential moss species or any any soft surface will do? Yeah, you know, there's places like where Douglas fir don't nest like if you look in the Gulf Islands, Texada, places like that, the Douglas fir doesn't really seem to grow a lot of moss, you know, more lichen and uh but they've been known to nest on on duffy substrates also. Uh, moss seems to be preferred, but uh, but there there is some evidence that they they use other substrates like like duff. Right. Tom, do you have any more questions? He's done. He's done. Okay. Anybody else? This is your last chance. So those that was a lot of questions, Bernard. Thank you so much for fielding all of those. Um, as you can see, this group was very keen to hear your presentation and um, very good crowd tonight. That was that was awesome to see the numbers. So oh, Don, got... Don has his hand, hand up. Go, unmute, Don. Thank you. Sorry about that. One last right. question. Is there any um, association of the um, Marble Merlets with First Nations? Are they... Do they know the bird or have any relationship with them as there's more interest in 
First Nations as forest caretakers. I just wonder the Merlot is such a iconic species for the, for some of us for protecting the forest. I wonder if there's any First Nations association. Um, there is some, and uh, again, this is something I need to explore a little bit more myself. Um, you know, I know uh, um, the Heisla up in Kitimat area, um, they have a, a word for the marbled merlet. They call it the Kuiau. And, um, and so, you know, they have a name for it. So they, they, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been noted in, in their lexicon. Um, uh, and there are various guardian uh, groups like the Gitgat down out of Hartley Bay that are doing seabird surveys up and down, um, up and down uh, um, Douglas Channel. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, um, there, you know, there, there's, there's, there's some reference to marble merlots with some of the U.S. First Nations also, but I don't know a lot about it uh, beyond uh, beyond the word in Heisla for marble merlot. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's another. It's not a well-known species, I, I don't think, in their lexicon, and so it, it might take a bit of digging to come up with some of the some of the information around it. I had a, a linked question to that one. I was also wondering about the First Nations when we talked about the first nests being discovered. Were they really the first nests that were being discovered, or were they the first nests being discovered by um, agencies, governments, etc. of of our time, as opposed to historical knowledge by the, by the First Nations. Yeah, I mean, um, I know first, you know, First Nations have, you know, uh, stories of 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 um, of the seabirds' sounds in the forest, but in terms of an actual nest, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know that they were, you know, climbing trees or or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one that would be uh, interesting to dig around for uh, more information on. Uh, there's lots of comments in the chat. Thanking you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I hope that you're as glad about being here as we are about having had you here. <laughs> it thanks. was a, a lot a lot of information shared here, and uh, like I said, a large audience. So thanks to Agnes who suggested you uh, way back when. And uh, and so oh, thanks, I thanks. Think, yeah, I yeah. Uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the invite and uh, and like I say, I don't do a whole lot of this, and so I get kind of nervous and uh, and uh, freaked out about it. But um, but I, I'm I, I'm happy to uh, happy to be here and uh, and uh, yeah. So I appreciate the invite and. Um, and uh, being able to having the opportunity to give this presentation. Well, you, you did a great job. And I think a lot of us learned a lot and very happy to have you here. Thanks again, Bernard. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And for everybody else, uh, if you haven't signed up for Christmas Bird Counts, remember christmasbirdcount.ca. Uh, one more very quick little announcement. Uh, Rocky Point Bird Observatory is doing something a little different for a fundraiser this year and we're actually participating in a Christmas craft show. If any of you are crafters and, and have things that you would like to donate to the, the cause, uh, you can contact Galia Lasner or me and we'll uh, make sure that we connect on that. And if you're looking at buying, we're gonna be at the Langford Legion on December 10th. So thank you everybody and uh, enjoy the good birds around here. Bye for thank now. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Thank you.